So, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon. How are you feeling? Because this is quite a challenging time of the day. After a lunch, did you enjoy lunch? Well, yeah, you did? That's good to hear. And were you able to meet some new people? Or you went to see the old fellows already? Let's try to take the opportunity today to reach out to new people. That will be fun. Maybe just as a starter after lunch, look behind you, see who's there and present yourself. That's maybe nice. Just a quick, a quick introduction. <laughs> Spontaneously, yeah. Just say, hi, my name is... Okay. Okay, now I do cause a problem. Thank you so much. So easy, isn't it? It is so easy just to reach out. But now you must stop. Oh, and now, and now, yes, I lost it. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to start with part two from the research track. And, and welcome to you all again, also via the live stream, still joining us. It's great to have you. We know that you are quite numerous, so, so it's great. Stay connected with us uh, during this uh, afternoon research track program. Great. I'm going to invite here on stage for the duo talk, because we are going to talk first about mobility. And I, where, oh yeah. It's over here now, the two chairs, they are for you. And I uh, kindly invite Alessio Filippi, from NXP, Semiconductors, of course, and Margriet van Schijndel from the TU Eindhoven, Program Manager Mobility, Eindhoven AI System Institute. And um, you got a tremendous challenge uh, in a limited time to tell what an exciting journey the two of you are, are having at this very moment. So please, take the floor. <laughs> well, thank you very much. And an exciting journey it for sure is. And it will take uh, several years, this journey together. I'm really excited about that. We will talk with you about robust AI for safe radar signal processing for, in this case, mobility applications. And I will tell you first why we think this is relevant and essential and why this fits also the TUE and the EASY program on mobility. And having said that, I'll hand over then to Alessio, who dives deeper into the processing part and the AI. So we have four parts. Um, I will do the kickoff, as said. I'll give you a bit of background on automated driving, so you understand how to put the work that we are doing together. I'll make a link to the EASY program, and then Alessio takes over for the second part. I think many of you will have heard of automated driving. For me, the term is normally a bit longer, and I say normally connected, cooperative, and automated mobility. If I talk to other mobility people, that's normally how we say it, but in brief, it is automated driving. Why is it so important for me to stress it like this? Because if you have connected, vehicles and infrastructure, if they are cooperative, working together, you can achieve much more than if you have a single vehicle that can automatically drive somewhere. And that is for me very important because if you have more assistance approach, having all those assets working together, you can make a big difference in reducing the environmental footprint of mobility. And I think that is something very important for us to be working on. You can also reduce congestion. You can also, not reducing, but really increase road safety while using those technologies and connecting these assets. Make them work together. And last but not least, you can also develop your systems in a way that they are more user-friendly, user-focused, addressing the needs of the user of your system, whether that is a person going somewhere, or someone more on the logistics side, providing transport of goods, equally important. 
That's overall what I see as benefits of automated driving. But if you ask that to a couple of experts, we did it to a year ago, we asked about 200 people on a large conference, what do you think for a user are the main uh, benefits of automated driving? This is what you get. Safety stands out, flexibility, comfort, and accessibility. I think that also the European Commission has seen this is a very important topic. And they have a lot of policy documents, I won't dive into that too much. But looking at several of the, the, those documents, you have a strategy on mobility, and their automated driving, for those four benefits I mentioned, is a key topic. How to use that. A document that some of you may know better on the European Green Deal also has a dedicated chapter on mobility, on leveraging the digitalization of mobility to decrease the environmental footprint. And if you combine several of those documents, it's very clear that the European Commission sees that we, as Europe, have a vision to make our industry a world leader. Sorry, the image here changes. This is uh, <laughs> tricky. I see something different. Yeah, now it's the same again. I was completely lost. I was uh, in someone else's presentation. Hmm. <laughs> The European Commission has a vision to make the European industry world leader in the development and the actual deployment of connected, cooperative and automated mobility systems and services. The research and the implementation, both. But making that happen requires a systems approach with many stakeholders. And some time ago we drafted the picture and you can see different colors, different types of stakeholders, ranging from industry, regulatory bodies, road authorities, service providers, and then green research. You need to have them all together. But how do you do that if you don't have an instrument to get those people together? Almost impossible. So they launched a partnership on CCAM. Uh, it exists since about one and a half year and they have uh, different chapters on how to work on, on these uh, technologies. And as a university, we're heavily engaged in this partnership. We are leading, not by coincidence, the topic on AI. Yes, you should have guessed that, within this partnership. Then if you look in this partnership, there are about 200 parties members of this. And at the initial stage, we've asked them, what do you think should be research priorities for this automated driving, for this CCAM? And there's a whole list. I won't go through the list. It's too much. But what you can see is that number one is environmental perception. What's going on around a vehicle and how to interpret that data? What to do with it with these images? Is someone approaching you, moving away? Is the person, is it something else? What's my world vision? around me, and how do I use that? I'll move to the EASY program, and I hope the link will be logic for you. Within EASY, we have a program called Responsible Mobility. And within the program, we have five program lines based on various societal and industrial challenges and key research themes. And within each program line, we have a portfolio of projects. The first program line that we have is called Vision, Perception and Actuation for Safe Automated Driving. And the definition of such a program line comes, for instance, from inputs from industry and member states in such CCAM partnership. We see what's going on there, what is needed on research, and we use that to draft our research programs. Part of this research program is new and updated vision and radar systems and technologies and advanced AI-based perception. Well, that's what we are working on. Um, within this program line, we, OTAUI, yes, NXP and uh, we have established a so-called Easy Mobility Lab, 
a close collaboration working on technologies for accident-free mobility. We are there advancing perception technology, so making sure that mobile systems will become able to understand what's going on around them and how to act in such situations. We have a couple of projects within this Easy Mobility Lab. And a very big and a very important one, <laughs> yes, for sure, is called RAISE. That's the abbreviation, and Alessio can tell you all the details about this. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Monke. Thanks. Thank thanks, and uh, well, welcome to everybody. Good afternoon. So my name is Alessio Filippi, and I uh, come from NXP Semiconductors. And uh, yes, as uh, Margaret mentioned, is, uh, yeah, this autonomous driving and environmental perception in particular is, is a challenge that has many, many uh, aspects. And uh, this afternoon I'm going just to yeah, bring forward some example of wh where or how what, bah, what we are doing with the university together with TUE to bring the technology forward and uh, to solve the challenges of enable, enabling an autonomous uh, driving. One of a small step uh, uh, into that uh, direction. So let's see, yes. So I would like to start first uh, on uh, reflecting on how I see the cooperation and the working together between industry and, um, and uh, academia. I am personally a strong believer of, the, uh, of this clear win-win situation. I always like to work with TUE. We like, as an XP, to work with TUE um, because they bring forward what I call the fundamental research. That's the role for me of the academia, the, the fundamental understanding of how things work and how we make this machine learning or artificial uh, intelligence work better. And then from the industry, we take that learning and we translate in value proposition on the market. And I really believe that if we want to have a product that is different from the others, we must build it on top of the fu fundamental understanding of the basics. And that's where the, the cooperation or strategic cooperation between industry and academia brings the, the value. Then, as an example, then, then on this uh, race, I think is a, is a good example. Because when we engaged, uh, what it triggered our attention was this uh, yeah, more technical approach that uh, the, the, yeah, the professors, uh, partners, so Ruth Van Sloo uh, was our main contact there, and uh, add on this machine learning, which I use instead of artificial intelligence because I believe that's what is most relevant for us from uh, the industry. So machine learning, I think you, well, I guess as a attending this workshop, you, yeah, you are aware, so there is the classical signal processing where it's more model-based, we try to understand the problem, we model and then we solve the problem inside the constraint of that model. And then the machine learning is more data-driven, so I don't know anything, I just use the data and let uh, these very complex algorithms come out with a solution based on the data that we provide to them. What we are building up in this cooperation is what we call this hybrid model where we try to get the best of both worlds, as, as often uh, <laughs> we try, where basically we don't say that modeling is useless. Uh, when we understand the model, as far as we, our understanding is solid and, and valid, we should use it. We should all use all information that we have available. When the model fails, and when we understand that it fails, then we ask help to the data and to the machine learning uh, solution. And in that way, we get uh, basically much smaller, uh, simpler algorithms in machine learning uh, space. They are uh, uh, more stable, you need less data to train. Uh, they are more predictable, you understand better how they work. And at the end, I think that's how, that's the path we are following to bring, let's say, the value of this data-driven approach into a real uh, product, uh, differentiating product proposition at the end. What you see below here, some, maybe, yeah, the, is just a picture I took from a, one of the latest publication coming out from, uh, coming out from this uh, cooperation. That is a un an unfolded, what we do is called this unfolded neural network. So that's the simple neural network we use. And we basically boil down, we use the data to, oops, wrong button, shit. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Oh, again, <laughs> sorry, apologize. 
Uh, there you are. I want it was the one on top, not the one below. So what we train, uh, what we train are the parameter of this system only, and and try to deploy this. So this one W, you can read the paper, but this W and this lambda. Uh, that's what we train, in, in, we use the data to train, but the, the, the infrastructure, the number of layers and so are based on, on the model. And actually it seems to work uh, very, very good. So, but besides this, this approach, if I look at the cooperation, it goes also uh, beyond uh, the, let's say, the perception uh, problem. I mean, machine learning and, and AI is, is a powerful tool that solves whatever problem, and especially in semiconductor industry, we see the impact in, in many different aspects. So if you look at the RAIS uh, uh, program, and that's the reason the radar, if you recall the title, was between uh, brackets, is not only radar. Uh, we sue, we have the, yeah, in, in the radar domain, you see, we want to, we try to apply this uh, uh, structure to get the best, best radar image. That's what we want as a semiconductor industry. You buy our silicon, you get the best radar image. What you do with that image, it's up to you, but you get the best from us. And, uh, and you see this, all these arguments, so in particular the radar, the angular resolution, which is key challenge, and then is clearly linked to the environmental sensing. So you want to understand where an object is in your angular domain. We are looking at the uh, radar to radar interference because radars are active devices, so emit electromagnetic waves, so they can blind somebody else. And then, uh, of course, yeah, there, there are these big objects when you, you drive around, like a guardrail or, or a big, um, well, a guardrail, or even the street uh, or, or the big buildings, they are seen as mirrors. And if a mirror, you get a ghost image, so you see the car in front of you and you see this image behind the guardrail. And you need to rec recognize, classify, because a ghost tends not to be dangerous uh, in, in autonom autonomous driving. Then, but uh, beside radar, we also look at this uh, the, uh, machine learning applied to um, very low power applications, especially on, on audio. We have uh, products uh, in the yeah, hearing aids, so the, yeah, things that help support your hearing uh, uh, capabilities. And then, yeah, that's really very low power. So the, 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 the tool remains the same, but the application requirement changes and you have to tune it to address the new application requirement, like a very low power. And, uh, and the same trick in the audio, we have problem with these electrical vehicles that are very, yeah, very quiet to our ears, but they generate a lot of electrical, electric magnetic interference that interferes with all the other electronic equipment in the car. And that kind of interference for, well, is not, um, is not a, um, yeah, it, it's very random <laughs> and it's hard to capture in a conventional models. So that's where machine learning can help us uh, uh, modeling and managing this uh, interference. And the last one that is very much linked to the, yeah, our, uh, the reality of our industry, the semiconductor industries, we, saw also, we see also this, this machine learning you, uh, yeah, impacting our, really, the design flow of our uh, integrated circuit. Think about, uh, yeah, you have a very complex circuit design, and you need to, to verify them, and you need to calibrate them. And actually, you have a lot of data, uh, measurement data from, from your silicon. So the idea is that we can uh, uh, use this technique to improve the flow and efficiency of our uh, design uh, flow. And then the right one. So that was all from my side, and I'd like just to conclude with uh, uh, yeah, just two remarks. So for me, what I would like to you to take home is that from our perspective, is academia and industry working together, it is a winning uh, combination. I like to work like this, I think, uh, we should uh, further strengthen it. And then uh, the other one is that yeah, machine learning is not only data, data, data. We should not forget about the modeling exercise. Uh, understanding the problem, the content is very, very important to develop the right solution to the right problem. I want to develop, yeah, <laughs> I don't want to, to play with a tool just for the sake of playing with it. I want the tool to be efficient in solving the problems that I have at hand. And with this, I think, I don't know if the time is correct, but that's uh, concluded my talks. Wonderful, uh, yeah. Alessio, yeah. great. Well, thank you thank very you. much. You did great.
Okay, so it's not data for the data. And yeah, you gave us a lesson that uh, you, you said once the models are not working, then machine learning kicks in. Gets yeah. in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's, that's not always the case. In, well, uh, yeah, that's what we are you. trying that's to do. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But that's not at, not at every point the, 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 the practice. Now, reflections, comments. This is a great cooperation. Yes, the gentleman here in front. The blue skirt. Oh. Yeah. Hey. Thank you. Um, just a question on, on the safety part. I mean, yes. uh, as you're applying uh, machine learning, which is a statistical approach, how do you guarantee safety? Yeah. Mm. yeah. <laughs> Shall I? Yep. Uh, me? Yeah, it is uh, indeed a, uh, it is an issue. Uh, it's one of the, yeah, the challenges ahead of us. Um, I, I would say that, yeah, the approach we're following on this hybrid, uh, it, it is the problem. It gives a form of guarantee in the performance on the model. That, that's a model base a, as well. Uh, you, you, you guarantee the functionality of, of an algorithm or something within the model. And then you have the mathematical proof that it works there. But if the model doesn't hold, it, it doesn't. Reality is not, the, the, the model doesn't capture all reality. In this case, we, we, we are trying to develop the model where it gives us guarantee and the data is limited to, to a set. And that increases the level of reliability on the solution, or the confidence we have the solution, but it does, it's not the solution to all the problems. No, no but in an automotive context, of course, you have to provide safety levels. Yeah, it depends what you use the... The ASO, ASO yeah, C, yeah, 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 ASO so, but the, 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 indeed, if you use the perception to ASO choose B to, to break or turn, yeah, you, you must uh, so guarantee, but uh, so far we're not there yet. So it is an open challenge to really provide a functional safety guarantee of a machine learning or AI based solution. Yeah. But we're not the only ones struggling with that question and how to solve no, it. No, no, it's I open. Think there are several international collaborations ongoing where yeah, we're so both part ISO of. Yeah, so past 8800, of course. Exactly, yeah. <coughs> to be solved, yeah. Great, could you, yes, another question. Just throw it in the back, yeah. Oh, no. Wow, almost. Uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, I was wondering how much you rely on your, on your known model, basically. Because you have a part which is an, uh, a neural network or a machine learning, a learned part, and you, kn uh, you have a part that is known. Yeah. But um, how much do you rely on this known part? Uh, as in... Giving yeah. in terms of giving guarantees, basically. Yeah. Is, is it, is the question is clear. Yeah. Uh, is a bit. I try. <laughs> yeah. I understood it uh, correctly. Yeah. I would say it's hard to 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 break the balance so w between the two worlds. How much the model? Uh, so how much the performance relies on the modeling, and how much on the data, and 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 how yeah. much the predictability uh, uh, on the data. Um, Honestly, if I look at the solution we are getting, you must think about, for instance, you develop a model that assumes a given distribution of your data, but you know that data are not distributed like this, so the machine learning is used actually to estimate the distribution in an effective way. And then yeah. you are f using the data to, to, to fit the problem to, to, to your model somehow, because the model requires a distribution, you don't have it, you use machine learning to get it, and then there, there you go. Yeah, exactly. But what also can happen, of course, is that your uh, your AI is so smart, basically, that it first counteracts your model and then uh, provides a whole new model on top of that, basically, such that your, yeah, yeah. We, we, your known we model is cancelled yeah. out, basically. Yes, that's my understanding of, of, of the AI. Uh, we are not uh, trying to use it like this. We are really right, right to, to use it as an as a, um, enrichment of our model, if you will. Complementary to yeah. your model. Yeah. 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 But interesting angle you are yeah. sending yeah. in yeah. here. Yeah, Thanks. thank you. <laughs> so great. Okay, yeah, another question. Oops, yeah, <laughs> no one's there. <laughs> it will reach you. Hi. Um, Hi. Piers Kollenberg from the, the TUE. 
Uh, I have more of an ethical question since we're talking about, uh, well, let's call it just autonomous driving. Um, what are the risk levels or safety levels that are actually going to be reached or have to be reached before we can go into automated driving? So my grandfather is 93 and he's legally still allowed to drive. <laughs> but if someone would happen to cross before him, I don't think that he would brake. And I think some automated <laughs> cars would. Um, so should autonomous driving be on par with average human levels or with the lowest legal levels? Uh, um, it's a good question and also a very, very tough question. Uh, depends also on what you see as automated driving. If you mean full automated driving, that's still way ahead of us. But if you look at the supporting systems many of us already have in our cars, we have no issue with using those. But moving towards more uh, higher levels of automation with more and more functions taken away from the human driver, that question is going to evolve more and more because we are far less tolerant to faults made by the system than by human mistakes in driving. And that makes it such a hard question. You can't just one-on-one -on -one measure um, the, the number of mistakes made by a human or the system. It doesn't work like that. Mm -hmm. I think no one does have the answer to that yet. There are a lot of uh, discussions internationally ongoing on how to address that question. Um, and we're part of that, but we don't have the answer yet. Mm -hmm. Satisfied with the answer? Yeah, sure. Yeah. If I may, as well, a, a, a personal level, because I think it's, it's, yeah, it's not uh, the, the company, but uh, I, I would expect the machine to work much better th than, than the human. It's the only way we, I would accept the machine to drive around autonomously in the drive myself, a uh, personal view. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. That, that so would in your I view, we are uh, heading for, for machines being better. Yeah, the, the, the question was, uh, shall I put the, the, the same rule that applied to my grandpa to, to yeah. uh, drive to, to the machine? I said, no way, the machine needs to be much better performing to be allowed to drive together with me in, in, in the car. And I think that's the together with me, that's the, the, the key challenges is... Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we are humans <laughs> with our own shortcomings and the machine don't understand those shortcomings very well. And, and yeah, the cooperation the, the, is almost an HMI problem, uh, the, the interface between us and this car. Yeah. The human machine. Yeah, yeah I, I don't know. Teaming. I could imagine as soon as there is an autonomous Again. car, there's huh? everybody, all the engineers yeah. would be in line trying to trick it and say, hey, see, it doesn't work there. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we yeah. are done it, like it's this. It's easier to trick my grandfather. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you so very much for your bright question, yeah. Just finally, before we go uh, and dive some more into health, into the field of health, um, your cooperation, when, when it comes back to the Brainport AI hub kind of networking, um, you did find one another now for this project. How important is it to be quite um, near to one another? to work on this? Uh, I would and say essential. And that's, that's why m the, the PhD and the researchers all working in this project work both at the university and NXP. You have to meet, you have to talk, you have to discuss on, for instance, ethical questions you may encounter, but also definitely the technical ones on the approach. I don't think it would work if our researchers would be our researchers from the university yeah. and reporting to you once in a while. They need to be working together. And it's easier if you can reach out to each other or close yeah. to each other to, to see what other options there are. Yeah. Because the whole uh, program actually started a bit by coincidence. Because you yeah. meet, you discuss, mm -hmm. and you see opportunities filling needs that yeah. you have. Yeah, if so. So nice. because earlier we met people also on stage and they, by coincidence, met on the coffee machine in a way, so, so this is really the way we human beings yeah, yeah. apparently yeah. do yeah. work and find one another to, uh, to work together on big achievements. Yeah. Great, it was great having you here on stage. Thank Give you. them a warm hand of applause. <laughs> Wonderful, well done, well done, well done, Margriet and Alessio. Okay, now, AI-based approach when it comes to cancer patients, that's quite a, a subject which touches upon all of us as well. 
Um, and we have with us Rob Verhoeven, senior researcher at the R&D department of the uh, Integraal Cancer Centre in Netherlands. I don't think you have a, well, Integraal Cancer Centre in the Netherlands. Well, whatever. We can translate this in English. And uh, Laura, Laura, welcome. Laura Genga, Assistant uh, Professor Information Systems, Department of Industrial Engineering and Innovation Sciences at the TU in Eindhoven. We are curious to find out what you are working on, the two of you. Well, <coughs> thank you very much. Um, well, thank you for the introduction. And first of all, I don't know if everybody knows uh, Amsterdam UMC and ICANL. So first, a slight introduction about of the institutes I work at. Well, Amsterdam UMC is basically a merger of two of the academic hospitals in Amsterdam, the AMC and the UMC, making it now one of the largest Dutch hospitals. But more importantly, it has an extensive track record on the care and a resource for uh, SFO gastric cancer. My other employee is IKNL, in English, the Netherlands, the Netherlands Comprehensive Cancer Organization. It's a quality institute for oncologic and and palliative uh, research and care. We don't treat patients, but we do research on it. We try to improve the care. Uh, our, our, our overall aims are uh, to reduce uh, the, the, the amount of patients that are diagnosed with cancer, to improve cure rates, improve quality of life, improve reintegration into society, and if patients would die due to cancer, um, we would uh, try to enable them to die uh, with dignity. And most of these things we do with the Netherlands Cancer Registry, which we host and maintain. And to go a bit in, into a bit more detail on the Cancer Registry, um, here you see um, uh, a scheme on it. If you look at the bottom, we would think, if we think about the patient journey from a diagnosis in, into, tr into treatment, all of these things we want to register. Most of these things are still ma manually registered by our register, some, some things are automated, and in the end, uh, we re-register data on disease uh, characteristics, type of treatment, and the outcomes. Our research and development departments, including epidemiologists like me, but also data scientists, software engineers, try to analyze those data and make some, uh, um, generate some knowledge, which is translated into a lot of reports and scientific publications which, in the end, should improve care. Well, based on this Netherlands Cancer Registry, we have, have a lot of data on cancer patients. And we, for instance, know that there are about uh, 3,000 patients in the Netherlands annually di diagnosed with uh, cancer of the esophagus, and about 1,100 patients diagnosed with cancer of the stomach or gastric cancer. Um, and uh, for palliative disease, a disease stage in which patients cannot be cured anymore, we often group them together, which we also are doing for this project. And unfortunately, we also know that 38% of the patients with esophageal cancer and 48% of the patients with gastric cancer already have a palliative disease stage at diagnose. So directly after they are diagnosed, we know they are that they are not going to be cured. So the aim should be to improve quality of life, or at least remain quality of life and possibly also uh, um, extend the life. But these patients are quite heterogeneous. If we, for instance, look in which place in, the, uh, in our body they would have uh, metastases, we see that it's quite all over the body and it's quite different. We see uh, metastases in the liver, in the brain, in the bones, um, on your, um, in your lungs and well, sometimes multiples, as you can, uh, would have probably figured out, these per percentages uh, do uh, add up to over 100%. But we also know there's quite some, va quite some va variation in the treatment of these patients. This is a, a, treatment, a figure on how, how these patients are treated in the Netherlands for a specific type of esophageal cancer, and we see uh, different types of treatment. We see patients that are treated with the surgical resections, patients that are treated with a combination of chemo and radiotherapy, which we call chemoradiation, systemic treatment, which includes um, the chemotherapy, radiotherapy, and patients who did not really receive any of those treatments. And we also see that this, we see um, a variation within one age group, but also variation between age groups. This is, so there's quite some variation in how these patients are treated. Also basically because these patients vary. Uh, but if we look 
within one type of treatment, for instance, in chemotherapy, this is from a, pro this is from from a, from a publication of my group of a couple of years ago, we looked at which types of chemotherapy combinations were used to treat these patients. You see that there are almost 50 types of different types of chemotherapy are used to treat these patients, which we, which of, which uh, su suggest that um, we might not have the optimal treatment yet. And at the end, if, if we have treated these patients, we can look at their survival. How long do they live? Well, this is our kind of figure we quite often use <laughs> in the medical domain, in which at time point zero, at time diagnosed, everybody is alive 100%, and over time, we see how much patients are still alive. Looking at uh, about uh, one year after diagnosis, only about 20% of the patients are still alive, and nearly all of them have died after two years. So we would like to improve that. And to do that, we would like to give um, physicians and, pa and patients better I information on how to treat, how to choose the treatment. And we think, really think information on possible outcomes is key. Therefore, we have, desi we have uh, designed a couple of prediction models and put this on a website to improve uh, the information. For instance, we again see such a curve on the survival. Um, we see that uh, over time the survival decreases, but we also know that this, these kind of graphs are quite hard to understand for patients. There's some kind of dissimilar information is uh, at, the, at the top right, in which we see uh, that 63 patients are still alive six months after starting chemo radiotherapy. But we are not looking only at survival, we're also looking at quality of life. And here we see that uh, the quality of life first has a, has a slight dip, but uh, afterwards increases again. We have information on what kind of uh, uh, adverse effects we have uh, in, in, a, in, a in a specific type of chemotherapy. So a lot of information on what we can expect from the treatment. But now the really problem why we are here and why I'm, I'm working together with Laura. Um, the current and the traditional uh, prediction models that we use are usually limited to the first type of treatment after diagnosis. So if, the f if, the, if a patient is diagnosed, we have quite some information and we have, quite, have quite some prediction models on, um, on, on the outcomes of the patients. But you can imagine if a patient lives one or two years uh, at multiple times during the treatment <laughs> trajectory, you have to make treatment decisions. And all of these traditional prediction models, or, or at least nearly all, are just focusing on the first treatment and do not take um, treat, uh, information that has become available over time into account. So what I would ideally want is prediction models that uh, could be applied at any time during the uh, whole trajectory of the disease, but also that take into account all recent information. So if a patient just had received uh, uh, just have undergone a, a CT scan or a specific uh, blood type test, um, then we, we would like to include that information, which is currently not possible. And, well, this brings me to my collaboration with Laura. Thank you, Rob. Uh, good afternoon. In the second part of this talk, I'm going to tell you a bit more about uh, how we are uh, approaching this problem that Rob just introduced, so which kind of methodologies uh, we are developing. Uh, so, first of all, we decided to focus on a family of techniques known as predictive process monitoring, which falls within the broader domain of process mining, in case somebody here maybe is already familiar with. Uh, the main idea of these techniques is to exploit uh, historic data, in particular data that collect for every patient the sequence of treatments he or she has undergone, and, uh, of course, how much uh, was his or her survival time and to use these historical traces to train predictive models. And these models can then be used at runtime to deliver different kind of predictions. In our case, we are interested in estimating the survival time. Why do we focus on this family of techniques? Well, the reason is that they have two characteristics that are quite uh, suitable, quite convenient for our purposes. The first one, they do allow, uh, they are designed to allow predictions at multiple stages, multiple times in the process, which is in line with what Rob was saying about the need of having more dynamic uh, models, able to take in recent information into account and able to 
uh, deliver predictions at different moments. The second reason is that these techniques allow us to incorporate and to represent information on the order with which activities, in this case, treatments, are executed. Why is that important? Well, Rob already mentioned that there is a lot of variability in this data set, but analyzing the data set, we saw that the variability is not only that different patients could undergo with different, completely different treatments, but instead they might have some similar treatments provided in different orders. We might, so we are also very interested in uh, analyzing whether the order in which uh, we deliver treatments with respect to each other or the moment in the uh, treatment procedure in which we chose one treatment or another has an impact on the survival time. And to do that, we need efficient techniques that allow to take that into account in the prediction. So the order is also key for our own analysis. Of course, this requires to make some choices on how do we want to represent this order relationship in practice. There are different strategies that can be used, and each of them will lead also to different kind of patterns of treatments that we can analyze. So far, we've been investigating three main strategies. The first one, the naive one, is encoding the entire sequences of patients, so providing our classifier with a representation of the complete, uh, totally ordered sequence of treatments the patient has been provided with, which is the easiest technique, but it's also the one from which we expect uh, not to derive uh, very good results because, uh, well, there is a lot of variability which makes it challenging for a predictive model to find irregularities in such a sparse space. And for this reason, we're also investigating techniques that actually allow us to derive uh, more, uh, to derive smaller but more significant patterns of treatments, so specific combination, specific groups with specific ordering relations of treatments that have a higher impact uh, rather than the entire sequence. That can also be done in several ways. So far as patterns, we are exploring uh, subsequences, which is the easiest way, but also the one where we might miss some more complex relation, and that's why we also apply what we call local model techniques that allow us to derive higher level, more complex ordering relations and check whether they exist in our data set. Of course, uh, once this is just a decision of the encoding, we also need to select what are the most suitable uh, predictive models for our analysis, and we have been trying different ones, ranging from standard machine learning models to more modern deep uh, neural network architectures. So the first question is, well, how do we choose having all these uh, possibilities available? And uh, uh, what we've been doing so far is, using, classifi is uh, using classification performance to check which combinations seems to achieve the best result, which is also not easy to do because there are actually many different performance metrics you uh, need to take into account, which might be not always, uh, why not, not, not always agree on the final winner. But uh, uh, for example, here I reported performance in terms of C index, because this is a commonly used uh, performance metrics in survival analysis. It measures the capability of the model to keep consistency between uh, the temporal ordering of predicted samples with respect to the real values. And uh, you see in the slide that some results obtained with the three best uh, uh, predictive models with the different encodings. The red one is the baseline, namely a predictive model without any information on the treatment. And as we expected, it's the one that obtained the worst result which was expected, but it's also nice to have confirmation on the data that uh, initial char patient characteristics alone are not enough to have an accurate prediction. We also need to know which treatments are applied. As regards the different strategies to represent the ordering here, we don't see a huge difference. The uh, yellow ones are the ones that obtain the best results for the specific classifier. The green one is the one that obtain the best results in general. But if we also consider other performance metrics, for example, the error for single samples, then we saw that uh, actually focusing on, por on portions of the processes work better, best rather than considering the entire sequence. And that's why we focused on this strategy. So these are, of course, uh, predictive models that are not perfect, but they are already a, a good start and already allow us to identify a set of patterns that are likely to have an impact on the prediction. We can use, in fact, information related to the future importance of the classifier to identify this set of patterns. However, this is sometimes not enough because the impact on the survival, it is of course important, but it's not the only metric that can be used to measure how interesting a pattern is. And for this reason, we were also developing on a more multidimensional analysis that allows the human analyst to actually delve into the obtained patterns and uh, make measurement related 
not only to the impact, which is one of the measures, but also, for example, on the support and also on how specific a pattern is. It's something that I see only for a particular category of patients, or it's something that actually I can find more in general. And uh, so this is an example of what you will see as an output. Uh, you can, it can be graphic, so you can plot the patterns that we found and uh, immediately allow the analyst to have an idea where every pattern is located, and this enables analysis uh, such as, well, you might have uh, two patterns with very similar discriminative power, but one of them is much more frequent, so maybe it's more interesting because potentially it affects a higher number of patients. Or the other way around, a less frequent pattern might be more discriminative. So these are all trade-off that can be and should be supported. So as a preliminary results in this analysis, we actually managed to find a bunch of patterns with shown a uh, significant impact on the survival time that was uh, assessed both looking at the data. So for example, we saw uh, that uh, for the pattern that is shown in the slide, that is a combination of carboplatin and a repetition of paclitaxel, we saw that patients that had this kind of pattern actually had a higher probability curve significantly higher probability curve with respect to the patient that did not. And more importantly, these patterns were actually validated with our domain experts, so this gave us uh, confirmation that the method is able to find interesting pieces of information. But at the same time, we also found some limitations. One of them is that at the moment, we are not able to uh, distinguish between cases, uh, uh, distinguish between the impact of the patterns and potential impact of patient's characteristics, which is a problem when you have pattern like the one in the slide, which is a combination of chemo and surgery, which is actually provided only to a very specific group of patients. Not everybody is eligible for this kind of treatment. And if you are in this situation, then the question is whether the impact that you're seeing might actually be affected by the patient's characteristics. And that's something that we need to filter out. And uh, another limitation we observed was that the most interesting cases are often the ones that uh, are about the patients that live the longest. Because it would be very interesting if we can give a description of a reason of why these patients are living longer with respect to similar ones. But they are underrepresented in the data sets, they are a minority class, which means that if you try to apply a single model, a general model, you might very well miss interesting explanation for these patients. So we are now currently working on refining our method. So we are now working on defining meaningful groups of patients, meaningful clusters, and apply this method for the specific clusters. Because in this way, we expect that we are able to somehow isolate the effect of the pattern by the patient's characteristic, and we're also able to zoom in for classes of patients underrepresented otherwise. So what we would like to obtain at the end is some kind of interpretable model that for a single cluster of similar patients allow us to find combination of patterns that discriminate between longer or shorter survival. This is currently work in progress. And before concluding, just an overview that the project actually is uh, uh, within a longer project. It's not only about the um, building accurate predictive models, but it's also about how to use this information to then distill recommendations for new patients. But this will be the second phase of the project. So summarizing, we showed you how we are using predictive process monitoring techniques, AI techniques, uh, to build uh, accurate predictive models for uh, stomach and esophagus can cancer patients. And uh, this analysis is already showing promising results, but also some limitations, as I uh, see, as I said. So we are currently working on that. And uh, I think we reached the end of our time. Uh, but uh, if you have any question or if you're curious to know a bit more about what we're doing, we're very happy to have a talk with you offline or you can reach out via email. Thank you for your attention. Ooh. Thank you so much, Laura. Oh, wonderful. Wow. Whew. That's quite some information. Is there anybody who has a first uh, question or remark? Are you still thinking, what did we hear here? Yeah, yeah, you get a micro, oh no, you, yeah, that's better maybe because it's not, <laughs> yeah. You can just talk, yeah, yeah. Well, thank you very much for the nice presentation. I had more questions uh, on the, the latest uh, part of the presentation. You said that the, the next steps is trying to classify or to, to identify the group of patients and which wouldn't be just on the individual, uh, would that be possible to further scale it down to individual? Me as a patient, I care about myself, mm -hmm. honestly. 
that you and could if predict. you get the best treatment for me that that would be even better that would be the the final goal however uh, the problem in doing that for uh, predictive models is that you need uh, a minimum support uh, min to to make your pattern reliable because if you only see if you only see a single case in which the treatment works uh, that's not really enough to yeah, to make uh, reliable assumptions on that. So we, we want to go towards using groups as small as possible, but there is a minimum number to guarantee some statistical, to, give, to provide some statistical significance that what we're seeing makes sense. Makes sense. What is a minimum number? Yeah. yeah, that's an excellent question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I think at the very least something around between 30 and 50, but that's, mm. very, that's already really low. So ideally, if you can go more towards 100, that, that would be a bit better. That, that, is, that is different and, and maybe better. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. A lot of question remarks. It is amazing, huh? Yeah. Please go ahead. I will <laughs> it will take some time. Yeah. How long have you been working together now? I think in this, this is project? the second year. Yeah. How, how long? This is the second year. The second yeah. year only. We wow. started with a master student, and then we uh, we started supervising a PhD student last year. Yeah, great. Yeah, please go ahead. Tell us who you are. Uh, Franz von Veil from uh, Fontis. Um, I reckon treatments uh, in themselves change uh, over time. Uh, how do you take that into account in this research? Ooh. Well, that's that's the. I think um, why it's m so important to be in touch with physicians and, and, and know what is changing. And, and of course, um, these are the things we have to take to in, in, into account because some treatments that we used yesterday might not be used today. Tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. So tomorrow. Yeah. So it's, it, 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 it's changing rapidly. But on the other hand, some things have been the same for the past 10 or 15 years. So um, I think it, it's good to have a, a combination of, of medical experts, epi epidemiologic experts and data scientists yeah. working all together to just to um, combine everything. Yeah. But it is key that you have them on board yeah. all the time because if not, <laughs> you will not be able to take it into account as, as uh, was just stated. Yeah. So yeah. it's very important once you want to be successful, then you, you, you must have a certain um, a mixture of uh, uh, stakeholders at your table. Yeah. If not, y you cannot do a thing. Indeed. Whatever clever model and AI solution you will come up with. Yeah, that, that's, that's interesting. Mm. Okay, other questions? You got there, oh, they're gone, the email addresses, but you have them in the program. So you will be able to find them, that's for sure. Thank you very much. A final Thank round you. of applause <laughs> for Rob Verhoeven and Laura Genga. And now let's talk about the AI economist. What could that solve? Ah, there you are already and you have your microphone, Stefan Zeng. Yeah, because you are wondering what, what can we use the AI economist for? What problems could it possibly solve? You are our final keynote before our next break, but we are very anxious to learn about the AI economist. All right, thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, so first, first of all, thank you so much for the to the organizers for having me here. Uh, in particular, Carlo and Patricia. I don't see him here. Um, anyway, it's a, it's a delight to be here. I'm actually from the Netherlands. I grew up in partially in Etenleur. Who knows Etenleur? Yeah. Yeah, all right. Um, it's south of the river, so it's uh, Carnival's Land, as they say. Uh, but now I live in California, and I'd like to tell you about this research project on the AI economist and how it's going to change economics. Um, and our research is inspired by big social economic challenges of our time, right? Income inequality has been increasing over the past decades. Temperatures are rising, and more recently, inflation has been rising. These are really big challenges, and one thing they have in common is that the underlying economics that causes these issues is very complicated. And traditional eco economists have a really hard time understanding how that works. And don't take it from me, take it from the chair of the US Federal Reserve, Jerome Powell. I, don't, I see the video is not playing. Um, you're supposed to see his face there moving. But he said, I think we now understand better how little we understand about inflation. 
because in the US, inflation is also a huge issue. He said this um, last, or this year actually, in June. Now, why is there such a poor understanding of inflation and all these related problems? Is that if you think about the basis of the economy, it's about everyone in the economy spending money, making money, working, taking vacation. That's the micro level, right? That's where the real economy happens. Then there's some gray box of processes that you, know, you can try to model, and at the end there is this magic number that you know, we understand as inflation, and this gray box is extremely hard to untangle. Now, in particular, there's a couple of problems here. First is that there's no time machine in the world, right? We cannot go back to the past and say, what if we changed you know, the way we handled the economy a little different, differently? Right? There's no way for us to really answer what if questions in the real world. Second, in economics, economists have this model of how you and I behave, but it's often very simplistic. Economists often say that we are like logical computers that look at a single number, whether we're happy or not, but that's simply not how we work. Third, there's too little data on how we respond to any change in the government's policy, right? So if the taxes go up, Maybe you decide to stay, maybe you decide to leave, but it's very hard to measure that, and therefore we have very poor understanding of people's responses. Fourth, there's a lot of diversity in the world, right? People are different, but if you look mathematically at how we can understand and capture that diversity and account for it, it's actually very hard. Uh, it's, you know, it's a, a, un, un, unfortunately, it's a feature of, of math. So, we can use AI to solve this question, and here is a framework to do so, and it's called deep reinforcement learning. So you start out with the real world, and you get the data that you can get from that real world, including priors. You take all the knowledge we have about hum individual human behavior, and you build this multi-agent simulation in blue here. And in this multi-agent simulation, you then model every individual agent, so that's you know, you and I, but also companies, the government, every agent in this economy using deep neural networks. Now, these deep neural networks have featured a couple of times here today, and one special thing about these deep neural networks is that they have the tremendous capacity to take in a lot of data, behavioral data, and then imitate real human behavior. Now, then you run this, this system, this simulation in a loop, and what you can do is then you can optimize the policies of the government for the scenarios that it sees in the system. So you can ask it questions, like how do we reduce inflation? And then this simulation framework lets you compare millions of scenarios and then figure out by using all these comparisons which of the government policies might actually work out to be better, right? Now, in this framework, it's not important that you can just numerically optimize for this inflation target or, or you know, inequality. You also need to explain why it all works, right? And mo most, most of all, you want to pick the right target, right? So I said you want to reduce inflation, but maybe that's not the only thing that you want to reduce. There could be multiple targets, multiple objectives that are competing. And the magic of this re re reinforcement learning framework is that it actually can take a lot of objectives all at once. So in particular, this is like a big advantage over classic economics where very often in that magic objective on the right, they're forced to use very simplistic objectives and very simplistic models for the agents in the economy. Okay, so why am I preaching that you know, this frame was actually the right approach? Well, I've seen in many cases in the past decade that each of the components in this frame that, framework that I just showed you, it basically is better than, much, much better than we had before. The neural, neural networks I, I mentioned, we've now shown that these neural networks are so good that they can generate real text, realistic text. They can generate realistic images. And deep reinforcement learning as a framework has led to policies and models that can play games better than humans. They understand strategy better than classic methods. They can look further into the future than all the other uh, models that we have out there. And this has led to really amazing performance in many discrete tasks. 
one underlying trend there is that because these models are so big, in the past, people also were afraid, for instance, that it's too big, we can't optimize them. But it turns out that in the past decade, we've made tremendous progress in actually optimizing those models. And the underlying trend uh, that also enables us to do that is that now we have hardware, including GPUs, TPUs, big data sets, and open source software that has really matured that lets us quickly build these systems. And this is a really, really important part. Now, specific uh, to economics is the idea that this agent behavior that I alluded to, right, the simplistic agent model that the classic economic economics is using can now be replaced by these neural networks that are much richer and that are much better at imitating our uh, human-like behavior, right? Um, and the idea is that if you start from this basic atom of the economy, you can model this better, and then you go all the way up the stack, then you, know, you will get better predictions about the how the economy is going to behave. You can do many more comparisons of scenarios that are much more realistic, and in the end, that's going to lead to better economic policy. So altogether, this leads us to ask, what is the ImageNet moment for AI yeah, for economics? Um, so who knows what ImageNet is here, actually, in this room? I'm not sure if I see a couple hands. Okay, so for the people who don't know, uh, ImageNet is this big image data set that was the catalyst for the explosion in AI back in 2011, 2012. So at the time, ImageNet was the first of the generation of really big data, okay? People talk about big data all the time right now, but ImageNet is arguably uh, one of the first instances where people show that if you build big data sets, is gonna give you really amazing AI capabilities, right? And so this image, image at moment means when is AI going to overtake everything else in economics as a de facto way to do economics? Now for that, we need to do a number of things. We need to have scientific progress. There's still a lot of scientific questions that are unanswered. We need to do more engineering. So we need to build the platforms that enable us to collect economic data, to train AI models, to do large-scale economic analysis. We need to establish common benchmarks and scenarios that we can compare across the world. And we also need a compelling North Star application to rally all people to you know, put more effort and energy into this. So today, the rest of the talk, I wanted to uh, talk about a couple of these aspects and just give you a flavor of what we have done so far. So first, let's talk about some research. So this is arguably, you know, don't look at me, I'm not a Hollywood producer, but this is a, an animation of, an, of a simulation that we built at Salesforce about three years ago. And in this research, we asked, what kind of algorithms do we need to actually make this whole project work, right? So in this, in this simulation, what's happening is that you see four of these little mini agents, they run around in this Pokemon-like world, but the important thing is that we're simulating how they're collecting resources, working, and then making money with that. And as I mentioned before, the behavior of all these agents are controlled by these neural networks. And on top of this world, there's a government. And this government is asking how high it can set the taxes or how low it can set the taxes to improve a combination of productivity and equality in the world. So this is an optimal income taxation problem. And in more technical terms, it's a mechanism design problem where you try to take the response of the agents to the government's policy into account, right? And so as I mentioned, the government's setting these taxes, so in economics jargon, that's called a planner. And then there's workers who are doing all that economic activity. And what's really important here is that even though this looks very simplistic and it looks like Pokemon, I, I admit it looks like Pokemon, okay? But the point is that this is already complicated enough that if you give this to an economist, they actually cannot solve it explicitly, okay? Just to give you a sense for how limited classic economics is. And this is not, you know, this is a very far, it's very far from the real world, right? So what happens when you try to use machine learning for this? So if, if you are a machine learning researcher, this is the type of graph that you see. So in, on the right, in four color, or three colors, I should say, you see how the objective of the government is changing as you're training all the agents and the government policy in tandem, right? 
And so in particular, if you look at the green curve here, you see that it doesn't just go up monotonically, right? The government wants to improve social welfare, improve productivity, improve equality. But in fact, if you look at the green curve, it actually goes down after a while. Why is that? Well, as the government is trying to tune the knobs on its tax policy, the agents in the world are going to respond. If the taxes go up, they might actually work less. If the taxes go down, they might work more. And there's some balance there that the government needs to find, right? Now, from a machine learning perspective, this is actually a very hard learning, um, learning problem because every time the taxes are changing, the government, in fact, is changing the optimization objective for the workers in the economy, right? So if you, you, know, if you train a self-driving car, for instance, you have a single objective, and the world typically remains stationary, you know, more or less. But in this case, you have this double optimization loop. So it makes your machine learning problem twice as or quadratically worse, if you will, okay? And that's a problem that you need to solve. Now, in this paper, I won't go into the details here, but we showed that there's a mixture of structured curriculum learning where you essentially learn in phases uh, that lets you solve this problem and lets you achieve a solution that is better than all the economic baselines out there. So on the right, you can see that we improve uh, over the free market, the pr a progressive tax system, and a regressive tax system by over 16%. So here, progressive means a tax system like in the Netherlands, like in the US, where as your income grows up, you pay a higher tax rate and a higher income, right? But as you can see, that simplistic solution is actually not optimal. It turns out that there's this AI tax policy that is better. Um, and in particular, uh, the thing in blue there is actually the classic SAS tax. If, does someone know what it is? Okay, I didn't see any hands this time. Um, it's essentially um, the theoretical benchmark. It's, um, it's a tax system that was derived to be optimal in a simple setting, and that's the best you can do based on theory, based on pen and paperwork. Now, after we released this research, um, Two years later, this paper came out, and this is called Democratic AI. So here, um, DeepMind, our friendly competitors, they, they took a similar philosophy, but they had a different tag. They said, you have these artificial agents. What if we put real humans in a simulation? And it kind of scooped me, because we, you know, we also kind of did something a little bit like that, but you know, uh, we should let them have their victory too. And essentially what they said, let's have people play a game where you get to invest a little bit of your money into a public investment fund, then you know, the investment fund might grow, it might not grow, but at the end of the day, the AI is going to de decide how much money you get back on this, okay? So there's different ways of doing that. There's different ways of redistributing the gains of this game, and it turns out you know, there's there are a couple of classic you know, policies again. You can be strict egalitarian where everyone gets the same amount, okay? There's this libertarian view where you say, there's no distribution, you just keep your money, like, you know, and then there's something in between, okay? It turns out that humans prefer a redistribution policy that the AI comes up with, okay? Now, similar to like our result where I said, progressive taxes are not the best, regressive taxes are not the best, it's some blend, it's some hybrid, it turns out it's the same thing for real people. People statistically prefer the thing that the AI finds. Now that's very profound. And now here's a third example. If you now start to say, oh, what if these agents have some cognitive limitations like real people have, what happens in the system? So we have an intern called Pong, uh, she's very talented, and so she started the system where you equip these AI agents with rational inattention, which means that you know, as you walk around, time and energy are scarce, right? So we don't have a limited time, we don't have limited energy, but we need to choose what to pay attention to in the world. And this has a profound effect on your behavior. Now, what, she, uh, what Tom showed is that if you study a manager who has a number of employees, and this manager wants to optimize the productivity in its company, it has two choices. It can say, it can set the wages in its company, and the idea being that if I pay you more, you're going to work harder. But not all the agents might have the same skill level. Some agents might be 
lower skilled, some Asians might be higher skilled, and so perhaps you should be differentiating how much you pay the overperformers versus the underperformers. But this evaluation, this evaluation will take energy, right? So what, what Tong showed is that depending on the cost of, optim of this attention, of paying attention, of evaluating your employees, it actually sometimes is better to just pay everyone more and then you'll get higher productivity, but it will go at the expense of paying free riders. So in that system, sometimes it is in fact optimal to just allow people to do not as much as they are supposed to do, um, but in fact, it is more optimal for the employer. Now, this is very unexpected, and again, the, you know, the, the one point here I want to stress here is that if you look at classic economics, they cannot actually understand these phenomena using their classic techniques, because again, these problems are mathematically intractable. But the AI will find solutions that give you an insight in how the system behaves as you turn on like, more and more realism in the system. Okay, so that was the science part where I, I, I gave you a small sample of the algorithms and the results that you can achieve when you develop these AI algorithms. Now the second part is engineering. Because, as I said, these neural networks, right, the big theme is that they're bigger, and bigger is better, and we need more data, and we need to train for longer in more simulations. So that means that you need open source software, or at least you need software, that allows you to do that very quickly. So in our team, we built Warp Drive, and Warp Drive lets you run this whole loop, this multi-agent reinforcement loop, end-to-end -end on a single GPU or multiple, if you have multiple. And the short of it is that this gives you an order of 10 to 1,000 x speed up over running your deep reinforcement learning uh, loop as the patches had done before. Okay, so uh, I won't get into the details there, um, but the fact that you put everything on a single chip, right, you limit all the communication bottlenecks in your system, that will give you an, an enormous speed up. And that allows you to study bigger and bigger economic systems and study more realistic agent models. Um, so if you are interested, it's on GitHub, it's open source, anyone can download it and you can play with it. Okay, now the final part of my presentation is about this North Star. So what kind of problem is big enough that we would all want to see it solved and where this AI framework can have a pr profound solution? Now this answer that we came up with is this climate change problem. And so we recently launched something called AI for Global Climate Cooperation. And in this, in this project, we're essentially challenging the community to take this deep reinforcement framework, taking these economic simulations, and try to understand the game theory of climate change and how we can use that to hopefully save our planet. So why is that? Now, if you go to the state of the art in climate change research, you can look at the 2022 IPCC report, which is a report that's compiled by a whole consortium of scientists who report to the world what we know now about the science and the different forecasts that we have based on the most accurate simulations in the world. And in particular, they studied something called the SSP. So it, that stands for, social, for Shared Social Economic Pathway, right? So what they do is they take the simulation of the world with you know, all the countries in it, and they say, what if country X does this policy? Um, let's say we take the Netherlands, and what if the Netherlands invests a lot in mobility, invests a lot in, in solar farms and so on? Now, they came up with five of these strategies, and the important thing here is that what you see in the right is how much warmer things get over time under each of these SSPs. Um, so zero is uh, the level at 1950, and then uh, I think the top is five centigrades, and the, the, the magic line is 1.5, okay, or two, depending on you know, who you listen to, but certainly not higher than two, if you believe, if you have to believe the scientists. But you can see that three of those scenarios actually go above it, right, that's bad. And so we need to understand, right, which scenario is more or less likely, and the point here is that these scenarios are not unrealistic, right? So even in our current simulations, the economic policies that we choose as a national community have a profound impact on how the world's going to evolve. 
Okay, but the, the kicker here is, is that this report actually didn't tell us how likely each of these scenarios are, right? Is that red line very likely or is it very unlikely? It's actually hard to analyze that. And why is that? Again, because all of all these limitations that I talked about before. There's no time machine, there's too little data, we don't have to write agent models, et cetera, et cetera, right? And so there is no analysis of that in the report, okay? Now, the crucial thing that happens in the real world, and that's gonna actually gonna happen in, the, in, in November, is international negotiation, right? So um, do people know, does anyone know what I'm talking about? What's that gonna happen in November? Yeah? COP27, yeah, okay. Anyway, there's a, there's a conference, COP27, it's gonna be in Egypt, in the Sheikh El Sharm, I believe. Um, all the countries are gonna get together and they're going to talk about cooperation, or, or not. Because what, what countries do is that they negotiate with each other, they sign agreements and they say, I'm gonna do this, you're gonna do that, and we all agree that we're gonna, going to do this, and hopefully that's better for the world, right? But again, what is so unclear about that is what kind of agreements actually are best in terms of mitigating climate change? What agreements promote cooperation? Why would any country, any region actually follow through on something they've promised, right? And a very, you know, very obvious fact perhaps about the world is that there's no police force that says, oh, you didn't keep your promise, you know, bad, bad boy or bad girl. Um, and now you're, you get punished, right? That, that doesn't really happen in the world, not like that in, in any case, right? So the crucial aspect of a good agreement is that it has to be self-enforcing in the world. Countries, regions have to be self-incentivized to actually stick to their promises, and there's a huge economic component to that, right? Every country has an economic incentive or disincentive to actually stick with their promises. And the question is, which agreement is in fact optimal to propose in the world. Now, the, the one, one other reason, the game theory reason for why that's such a big problem is that why are a lot of countries perhaps not incentivized to cooperate with you know, the rest of the world? Why is it easy for any country to just like, you know, sort of be like a, a Streifvogel, an ostrich, like, you know, put your head in sand? It's because of the tragedy of the commons. Because most countries, a lot of countries are actually too small, right? So if they individually actually spend more on investing in green energy, they might actually not reap the returns if the rest of the world doesn't cooperate, right? In fact, you need everyone to work together and together mitigate. That's only when people will see a joint effect and they feel like that their contribution actually mattered. <clears throat> so the fact that, that there's no global, uh, global authority to enforce agreements, right, again, uh, and this trash of the commons dynamic means that there's, again, potential for free riding, right? Some countries can sign an agreement and not do anything about it, and they can say, well, you know, it's not my fault, like, you know, like, it's maybe that the fact that you didn't do anything. Um, and this kind of behavior is actually incentivized to some, some degree because of uncertainty about the future, you know? Countries might say, I don't know if what I'm gonna do is actually enough or, or too much, actually. Um, there's, there is uncertainty in our climate models, and that gives countries arguments to follow through or not follow through on their promises, right? And in particular, again, yeah, agreements are non-binding, right? So all of these, these aspects of the problem, again, mean that we need a better solution to understand the game theory of climate change and to use, you know, this is an opportunity for us to use this AI framework to analyze how we should think about cooperation in the world. So what is this AI for Global Climate Cooperation initiative? It's a competition where we are inviting students, researchers, postdocs, uh, professors to use our simulation platform to propose their solution, to implement it in the simulation, run it through the deep reinforcement learning framework, and then seeing if it's in fact better for the world in the simulation to put probabilities on those scenarios, if you will, that we saw in the beginning, right? Um, so the question is, can you design negotiation protocols and climate agreements that incentivize sustainable cooperation? Not just say that you're gonna cooperate, but actually follow through on it, right? So, does, and in fact, does your solution lead to optimal trade-offs between climate objectives and economic objectives that every country will face, right? 
and I'll repeat this again because it's really important, like would any decision maker actually start and then continue cooperating? Okay, so why, why is there a competition structure to this? Uh, well, we want to have fast progress because there's in fact very little research at the scale of this deep reinforcement learning framework where we can take all the different dynamics of the climate and the economy into account in this, in this um, you know, scenario comparison mode. And we really want to motivate the community to quickly try different solutions because every year that we are waiting and not doing something smarter about climate change, uh, we're losing a year. And you know, a year is it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big cost in terms of climate change. Um, so as, as a project, what we are aiming to do is that once we have all these solutions, then we want to take you know, the whole community, everyone who contributed to this project, and publish a scientific paper to you know, summarize what we found, and then actually brought, share those findings with policymakers who are go then going to be inspired, we hope. And then, thirdly, there should be a research community of, of researchers and engineers who are going to maintain and continue doing these kinds of scenario test, this kind of scenario testing. And this is in fact something that's already happening, but not maybe in the AI for climate change space, but you know, there are consortia all around the world, including in the Netherlands, where there's teams of engineers and scientists working on uh, building and updating climate simulations. And we believe that this game theoretic analysis should be an integral part of that moving forward. Right? And we could see that already in a 2022 report where they you know, did these SPSSPs, but they didn't have this more advanced game theoretic analysis that you can now do using this deep reinforcement learning framework. So I have a few more minutes. So I'll, I'll uh, quickly show you a cartoon again uh, in the same set vein as the previous cartoon of what we actually built. So we built Rice N. This is a simulation of a world with multiple regions. Uh, we have these climate and economic dynamics that are included in it. So we took the latest climate and economic data, we calibrated the structural parameters of this simulation, and then using that you can get predictions about the temperatures, the CO2 emissions, productivity and consumption in the world and so on. There's a bunch of more metrics there. And the, the magic part uh, here is that the competitors are going to think about negotiation protocols and agreements. So a very simple form of an agreement is that country one uh, is negotiating with country two, and uh, the first uh, clause is that I will mitigate X percent uh, of my climate, um, climate damages in, in the next year. Clause two is that you're expected to invest Y dollars into green technology. So I do this, you do that. And then if you defect, in fact, if you do not follow through, I will not do anything, in fact, for the next Z years, okay? And so the X, Y, and Z are just numbers that countries can pick. Um, and you can choose to do a lot, you can just choose to do not a lot. And these countries can then you know, negotiate about that and hopefully reach some sort of agreement. So this is the thing that the competitors will need to translate into software, put into the simulation. And that's the orange box on the right. And that together, you know, that, that negotiation part may or may not affect what's going to happen with the predictions. And again, because we can use these compare, we can compare millions of scenarios, now we can put probabilities in all these different trajectories, right? Temperatures going up, temperatures staying, you know, or sorry, temperatures not going up that much, right? We can now use probability, we can now associate probabilities to all the scenarios using this framework. Um, so we are going to evaluate all the solutions that people submit, um, not just based on their score, uh, because it's cool if you maybe save the world, but if it's not using a very practical solution, then it's useless, right? So we assembled this multi -dis uh, interdisciplinary jury to look at the score, look at the temperature increases that we find in, in your, using your solution, but we also ask, is your solution legal? Is it actually practical? And is there some form of ethical risk where your solution might be deemed unacceptable, right? And so we have this team of people from computer science, from climate science, public policy, law, economics, uh, and ethics. I, I see I left out ethics there, but there's an ethicist. Um, to basically look at your solution 
and judge it holistically. So not just numerically, but also in this more non-numerical sense. So I invite everyone here and online, I believe there's a live stream, to go to this website where you can find more information about this whole initiative. Uh, there's a schedule, there's events that we're organizing, we're organizing talks, um, there's team formation that's happening online, uh, and there's a Slack channel, Google Groups, where you can talk to us if you have any, if you have any questions. Uh, we're also on social media, and these pictures of, of, uh, are of the wonderful people who are my co-organizers. And yeah, like it's, um, it's a big ask in a way, because it's a hard problem. But also, it's an, a very important problem to solve, and it's, it's, it's actually a really big gap in our understanding right now of, of climate change. And that is, in fact, a, an economic problem, mostly, uh, today. Because nobody, nobody questions that climate change is real, that it's here, that, that the planet's getting warmer. But the question is, what do we do about it? And that's really an economic and political question, in a way. But the economics is core to whether or not we can actually solve it, because we need to understand what kind of policies and negotiations will let everyone be happy, economically speaking, so to say. Um, so with that, I want to thank you so much for listening, and yeah, I'll happy to take some questions. Thank you, Stefan. I'll lead, uh, well, first or second talk I'm giving to a more general audience about this, so okay. I think you guys are my, my little test group, I think, to see. Oh, uh, nice. <laughs> so, um, but I would say that, that um, you know, if you look at the Netherlands, for instance, about, um, you know, what, what is happening in the Netherlands with, you know, um, aardgas, you know, mm -hmm. gas, um, yes. gas exploitation in the Netherlands, there, there is, you know, I think there's new, news headlines every day now, right, where people talk about, oh, there's for us a short-term economic need to go get more gas but it might not be so good for us in the long term, right? So I think, I think a lot of people in, 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 public, in, in public debate are already connecting the dots, so to say. So yeah. uh, I don't think it's that controversial to say that there's an economic basis. No. Yeah. yeah, okay, great, yeah. Now, ladies, gentlemen, okay, there we go. Mm, yeah, here's the colleague with the catch box. Yeah, now this goes, I think, two times more. There's one there and one over there. Whoops. Hi. Um, thanks uh, for the wonderful talk. Um, one of the things I was missing in the talk, and maybe it's because it's too difficult to determine, but what is the, well, it's a difficult term as well in uh, economics, but what is the value of um, climate or climate change for countries? Because if you want to discuss anything, you need to d decide on what the value is for, well, whatever anyone has to offer or has to invest. Do you have any idea in what you would like to express mm. the value? Oh, that's that. Now then we have to go into whether I'm a Marxian or a <laughs> <laughs> uh, economist. No, I'm not an economist, so it's... Okay. No. So no. how do, would you go on determining what the value is? Right. Um, so... The value of climate change. So there is, in fact, a technical term for this. It's called the social cost of carbon. Um, and so one way to think about that is that people ask if the planet, uh, if our temperature goes up by one more degree Celsius, uh, how much more or less GDP do we get? That's one way of thinking about it. Um, there's a big p scientific debate about how you measure that, because obviously it's very hard to, to do. Um, so that's one way of interpreting it. People. Uh, generally speaking, people do think that as things get warmer, the cost of producing things is going to rise, right? Um, so, um, but I mean, you can, you can talk about value in many ways, right? There could be a more broad social definition of, of how much do we care about climate change, right? And that, that's more of a public perception question. So I, I'd say it's, it's a very multifaceted, you know, problem. There's one over there, and then we will come to you. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. It's always uh, nice to hear that uh, the optimal uh, uh, curve is not there for taxpayer, that it can be better 16%. So thank you for that. My name is uh, Jelle Oswaarde. Uh, I'm self-employed. Uh, I was wondering why those companies, those uh, big uh, tech companies like Salesforce, uh, Microsoft, and uh, Google, 
are uh, so interested in the research on uh, social dilemmas like economics, politics, and social. Because yeah, that's all three big techs are doing that, but what's the benefit? If I would be a CAO of Salesforce, I would say, yeah, what is the benefit for me as a company of doing uh, your research? Well, and this is the answer. <laughs> Stefan. Yeah, so that's a very good question. So Salesforce, in that sense, a special company. It has its values you know, high up, like, you know, it, it puts its values front and center. And one of them is, is just giving back. So the company spends 1% time, money, and product to, you know, social good. And one mantra of the company is that technology is a, a primary driver to positively improve society. And so this project is an example of that where I'm fortunate that I get to do this. Um, but also I would say that, that in some sense a scale of this project, right, is something that the company is willing to invest in. Um, so, yeah, I think, I think that's, it's, it's both culture and, and, and company values, I'd say. Okay. Combination of the two. We have a question here in front. Yeah, if you want to throw the catch box. Yeah, that's the direction. Okay. <laughs> here. So, uh, thank you for the presentation. Yeah, uh, I have a question about the uh, feasibility uh, of the uh, approach. For instance, yeah, let's assume that everything went well and we have found a great solution for uh, climate change, um, for the climate crisis. Um, and hope and yeah, apparently, if if there is a solution found by AI, it would be like an unorthodox one. Uh, humans uh, wouldn't be able to find by themselves. So, uh, for such an unorthodox solution, let's say. How would you be able to uh, persuade the policymakers uh, to implement uh, an, an unorthodox approach found by AI uh, to uh, actually make an impact uh, in the world? Hmm. Yeah, no, that's a great question. So I think there's multiple parts of that. One is that you make, have to make sure that you have some degree of explainability to, of your solution. So that could be you're showing a lot of scenarios and say, you know, these are all the ways in which, you know, the climate could evolve. And like, it turns out this is just the best. Um, here are the reasons, here are the factors, here's like the things in the world that are causing this policy just the to Scenarios, better. yeah. Yeah, just like, you know, showing people scenarios mm -hmm. and examples and, and, you know, appealing to their intuition to some degree. Uh, I think the second thing really is to show that, that these policies, that the way that they're optimized really includes social values, right? So one big advantage of this framework is that I can ask you what you care about and we can do some poll here. What do a thousand people think that's, you know, about what's important? We can translate that into like a mathematical objective and then give that to the system. And really the, the, great, the great advantage of this system is that there's no limitation on the objective, right? And this is a big uh, limitation of classic economics. In classic economics, people want nice math, right? But a lot of objectives are not nice math. Um, but the system actually doesn't care about that. Um, so I think that, that having a representative objective or set of representative objectives, and again, doing this case by case comparison of, between what happens if you do this, what happens if you do that, that allows us to have a very transparent discussion, right? Where we have a very clear understanding of the trade-offs that exist between different social choices, right? And couple that with, I think the third thing is really, again, a big part of, of whether we are willing to do something or not is really economic, um, uh, economic stakes, right? So at the end of the day, it, it's really important for people to feel like, you know, they're better off or the next, our kids are better off, right? Uh, economically speaking. And so having that reflected in a system, I think goes a, a long yeah. way towards convincing people. Yeah. yeah. Convince the impact it does make at the very end. Yeah, great. Well, thank you so very much for having been with us here, Stefan from Etelure, Etelure. California. <laughs> great. It was great having you. Thank you. Okay, okay. We are going to uh, close down this uh, second part and final part of the research track. And uh, therefore, Carlo, I would like to give you the floor for the, the last words. Then we will have a coffee break and we will all be back for uh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, uh, Badu. At thank the very you. Yeah. Certainly, yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, yeah, uh, Steph and I met uh, two months ago, I guess. It was in Silicon Valley. There was a trade mission to uh, 
to California with a lot of ministers and also the royals were there, at least Maxima, because uh, Willem Alexander went sick. But okay, we had Maxima, so why bother? Um, <laughs> and and um, yeah, this, this was an interesting thing because we had this, this, it was on medical and urban mobility, but there was one afternoon at Stanford and we co-organized that and that was on AI and all the, the applications over there. That's where we met Stefan, but it was not only Stefan, there was also Tim Zaman from Tesla who's do, doing all the, or leading the autonomous driving at Tesla. And we had Henriette Kramer who does the AI research at uh, Spotify. So a, a lot of people, so it's not only the fact what I already told before that we make the machines here to keep Moore's law alive. Uh, so, so Silicon Valley is not only floating on that kind of surfing on that success and that technology from here, they also take some of our best people over there in order to, to progress there. But we like that, that's good for the world, and it's especially good if you ever now and then come back here and, and tell us these interesting stories, what's happening there. So keep this link alive, get to know him, he's approachable as well, and um, you stay at least for the coffee break now and maybe even some bit longer. But thanks very much for being here, Stefan. Okay, um, th th you got a, we got a glimpse a little bit of all the things that are happening. Um, if, if you count the number of researchers that we have, the scientific staff that, that gets involved with AI is about 300 at the university. And there's about 500 PhDs that do their work at least for a substantial part uh, based on AI. So it's quite a big stuff that's going on on our university. We should not be too modest on that one. And you got a little bit of a glimpse of all the things that's happening that we're doing together with the industry. But I'll just give you a tip. I um, already said that we're going to open our new lab at the former Rekencentrum, uh, but now it's going to be called Neuron. So it's the center of some kind of nerve system. So uh, it, it, it's you, you get the point there. Uh, the Neuron will be opened at the beginning of February, but then we also have our own room, etc., to restart what we already did before, which is called the Easy Cafe. And the Easy Cafe is um, an afternoon. We start around 2, 3 o'clock. And, and we invite some of these hundreds of researchers to just pitch what they're doing. It's a five-minute pitch, five-minute Q&A, next one. So it's boring, you just have to wait for five minutes and a bit more, and you will get an interesting more one. This is open for external people, so you're all invited to them. If you're not already on the list, make sure that you get on the list. It's easy at tua.nl, or find us at tua.nl slash AI, uh, but, but you will be invited for that one. It's this, this maybe eight, nine, ten pitches, and then, and that's the interesting part, we start discussing that uh, during beer and bitter ballot that we pay for. So that, that's, that's another tip to come there. So you're all invited for those one. It's a little bit different setup, but it's a little similar glimpse of what you got here for all the research that's being done. And we hope that there are some new ideas will be uh, going. So enough for now. Let's go to the coffee and exchange more ideas. And thanks for staying up to the last. Thank you very much.